So about 20 years ago, I was looking with my little brother at the night sky. And we didn't normally get to look at the night sky like the one I'm showing on this slide because we grew up in Chicago and the lights from the city drowned out the stars. So most nights, all we could do is count the stars. But on this night, there was a lunar eclipse. And so we were out there enjoying the majesty of the sky. And my brother turned to me and he said, do you think there's anybody out there? And I wasn't an astrobiologist then. I was a college student. But I thought about it and I said, well, there's a lot of stars. And at least some of those stars must have planets. And at least some of those planets must have the conditions for life. And so, yeah, I guess at least there's a few planets out there that have life. And I think that's how a lot of us think about that problem of are we alone. My job as an astrobiologist, as a scientist that thinks about that question, is to turn that train of thought into hypotheses that we can test with data and observation. And there's really three hypotheses I made there in my random ponderings to my brother. First, that stars are suns that have planets around them. Second, that some of those planets have conditions that would allow for global, breathing, pervasive biospheres. And third, that some of those planets that could have those global, pervasive biospheres actually do have life. Three separate hypotheses. Today I'm going to talk about how, in the 20 years since then, the data that scientists, specifically astronomers, have collected has revolutionized our understanding of those first two hypotheses and essentially confirmed them to be true. And how in the next 20 years, we're going to confirm the third hypothesis or, or fail trying by getting a large enough sample to know that if there isn't life out there, we know how lonely we are. So I'm going to talk about the last 20 years in two ways, or in two properties of planets. The size of the planet and how much energy the planet gets from the star. On the vertical axis of this slide, you have how big the planet is. Big ones are on top, little ones on the bottom. On the horizontal axis, you have how much energy the planet gets from its host star. I have hot planets on the left of the slide. I, I, I like thinking about the sun being on the left just because that's how we always learn these things as mobiles as kids. So just imagine the star being on the left and things close to that star being fried. Now, I put the axes in this way because this is related to that habitability question. I'm not talking about any kind of life. I'm talking about a specific kind of life. Remember, I want testable hypotheses. I want to know if planets are out there that not just are inhabited, but are so pervasively inhabited that the signals from life can be detectable across interstellar space. Now, if you ask me what kind of planets to look for, I actually think of a different analogy. I think about if one of you in the audience, who I don't know, asked me where to find your keys, I would say, well, look in the pants you wore yesterday, look in the jacket you wore yesterday, look under your coat rack and look under your nightstand and look under the couch cushions. Now, I tell you those things not because I know you have a couch or pants or a jacket, but I tell you those things because that's where I lose my keys and that's where I find them, right? And so if we're looking for life on other worlds, as astrobiologists, the first thing we do is we look at all the places on Earth that there's life. And in the hottest, in the driest, in the coldest, in the deepest places on Earth, we have found life so long as there's liquid water in that environment. And so when I think about global biospheres, that's why NASA's had this follow the water strategy. Now for these extrasolar planets that we want a strong biosphere from, that means we want global water. That means we want oceans. And that's where these axes come into play. Oh, I should say, I've got the solar system here for scale. Pluto's not on here. <laughs> not, not because Pluto's not a planet, I think it is, but it's just not on the scale that I'm showing, okay? <laughs> so the, the solar system's on here. We knew of, we knew of these, these nine planets. Um, and if you get too close to the star, we know that it's too hot because those liquid water oceans would boil, they'd turn into a steam atmosphere. We think this happened to Venus once upon a time. Conversely, if you're too far away, you get too cold. Now, you're not too cold for life per se, right? There can be life on Enceladus and Europa and these icy satellites in the outer solar system. Heck, there might be life on Pluto for all we know. And I hope we look for life on planets like this that have some reservoir of water near or under the, the, deep under the surface of the, those worlds. But that kind of life is not the kind of life that we're going to be able to detect with telescopes across the vast distances of interstellar space. We need orbiters, we need rovers, we need samples back from these worlds to look for life on them. We're not going to be able to see it in these planets because they don't have atmospheres to retain the signals that life is going to give off. I'll talk about that later. But you can be too cold, not for life in general, but for the kind of life that we want to look for, the global pervasive life. You can also be too small. If you're too small, you're like the moon. The moon actually gets the right amount of energy to have oceans on it, but it has no atmosphere. And if you don't have an atmosphere, you can't retain an ocean. On the flip side of that, you can be too big and you can be like the gas giants of our outer, outer solar system, which just have too much atmosphere for water to be stable at the surface. But between those four, between the too hot and the too cold, the too big and the too small, you've got this blue box. 
It's the happy place, it's the habitable zone. Planets that we discover that have properties that fall inside this box are ones that could have global oceans stable at the surface for long periods of time, for geological and astronomical amounts of time. Those are the worlds that we think could have big, robust biospheres that would give off signals we could detect from far away and use that to test the hypothesis of are we alone, or the, that we are not alone. So this is where we were in 1996. We had nine planets back then in our solar system. We knew of six worlds beyond our solar system. And if, like me, you think Pluto is a planet and you're a little bit of, uh, upset at not being called a planet anymore, don't worry. Because we now have a lot more planets that we know of beyond our solar system. Over a thousand have been confirmed in the last 20 years from the hard work and the tenacity of the engineers developing instruments and spaceflight uh, telescopes that have detected hundreds, actually more than a thousand worlds beyond our solar system. And this doesn't even include the planet candidates that we haven't yet confirmed, but we're pretty sure are planets. If we include those on the chart, this is what it looks like. This is a dramatically different scenario from the one I showed two slides ago where we knew of fewer planets beyond our solar system than we did inside of it. We have orders of magnitude more data. We've also gotten better at detecting the smaller planets. We have now know of planets that are about the same size as Earth, that get about the same amount of energy from their host star that we get from the sun. In other words, we know of planets that sit in that blue happy box that could have oceans and pervasive global bi biospheres. Now, almost all of the data I just showed comes from the Kepler spacecraft. That's a telescope that's orbiting the Earth right now. Actually, it's, or it's in own orbit around the sun. It's in space, and it's been looking for most of its mission at one patch of sky about the size of your hand. And I say that because it means that most of the dots I showed on that diagram came from a patch of sky about this big. So if you go out tonight and you look at the night sky, put your hand up and realize that there's thousands of worlds hiding behind your hand. That's different. It's a different place. It's a different night sky than we had 20 years ago. We also have learned to expect the unexpected. We know of super-Earths, planets bigger than Earth and smaller than Neptune, we don't have in our solar system. We thought they would be rare, so of course they turned out to be one of the most common kinds of planets out there. <laughs> we know of these planets like Kepler-16b, which would have a poetic double sunset because it's one planet orbiting two stars at the center of the system. So as the one sunset, one sunset, so does the other one. And astronomers thought that was impossible. Well, most astronomers thought it was impossible. I always thought that these planets existed, but that's because I was looking at a different source literature than they were. <laughs> so we have to expect the unexpected. We also have to look to visionaries in science fiction and other places for, for some motivation sometimes. And now when I look at the night sky as a result of all this, if I'm there with my brother, well, first of all, I look at it differently, because if, if I'm doing it now with my brother and my sister, I'm doing it with our daughters as well, and I'm probably looking down more than I'm looking up. But I also now know that the night sky is different. I know things about it that we didn't know as a society 20 years ago. Instead of saying, well, there's a lot of stars out there, and surely some of them have planets, I can say there's a lot of stars out there. And if we count them, we know that on average, if we crunch the numbers, every star on average has a planet. And about one in five stars has a planet that has the conditions that could host global biospheres. So if I count 10 stars, and there's a lot more than 10 on this slide, if I count 10 stars, I counted 10 planets and two planets that could harbor life. So those first two hypotheses have been confirmed, but that third one hasn't. And that's what the next 20 years are about. Now, there's three kinds of challenges we're going to have to overcome to change our view of the night sky again. A technological challenge, a scientific challenge, and a societal one. This is not a mistake. The slide I'm showing you has a pale blue dot on it, which is what we want to find and what we want to analyze. But you're probably having trouble seeing it right now because you're blinded by the white photons coming from the rest of this slide. Planets are dim. Stars are bright. In fact, the light from the planets that we want to grab is actually just reflected starlight from the host star. And the planets and the stars are right next to each other. And as a result, for every photon we get from the planet we want to see, we're going to get one billion photons from the star unless we cancel them out. And we have to cancel out those billion photons from the star without canceling out that one precious photon from the pale blue dot we're looking for. That's a very hard technological problem. Now, even if we figure that out, that pale blue dot is going to still be extremely pale. And it's hard to see. You still might not be able to see it. It's right there if you don't. And to see dim things, if we see these worlds, they will be some of the dimmest, faintest things we've ever observed with any instrument ever built. 
And to view faint things, there's two things you can do. You can expose your, in a camera, if you're taking a picture at night, you can expose for a longer time, or you can get a bigger camera. So as astronomers, we like to build bigger telescopes. <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope has been in flight for 25 years, which is a marvelous technological achievement on its own. It's about 2.4 meters across. I'm, I'm about 1.9 meters high, so I don't know, about here to the ground, from my hand to the ground, is about how big around Hubble is. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be about a factor of three larger than Hubble. But we think that if you want to get a really good sample size and answer the question of are we alone or at least know how lonely we are, <laughs> we need a bigger telescope than even what the Webb is going to give us. And we also need that technology to cancel out the starlight. And that's something that right now is called the HDST, which stands for the High Definition Space Telescope. Don't worry about memorizing because I'm sure the name will change at least two or three times before this thing ever actually flies. Um, but the thing here, that, the reason I point this out is because we, we're not counting on miracles. I have nothing against miracles. I told you I grew up in Chicago. I'm a Cubs fan. I was raised on miracles, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm hoping for one this October. But, but in NASA, we're not in the business of relying on them. We're, on the, we're in the business of steady technological progress, leveraging the things that we're already doing or have already done. So we look at Hubble and how it's been in operation for 25 years. We look at the Webb telescope and how it teaches us to build bigger telescopes. We look at Kepler, which I mentioned earlier, and another mission called TESS, which is going to do similar science to Kepler that tells us what is out there in the universe in terms of the planet populations that we're going to be looking at. And we're looking at the w First telescope, which we'll start building after Webb is finished, that's going to start developing the technologies to do that difficult problem of blocking out the starlight without losing any precious photons from the planet. So that's the first challenge, and if we overcome it, we can build something that looks like this and get Carl Sagan's pale blue dot. And Sagan was very poetic about this, and he talked about how everything that we've ever done as individuals or as a society or as a biosphere on this planet has happened on this one tiny dot. And that's really lovely to think about, but when I think about it as a scientist and I think I have to look at that dot and tell you whether or not there's life on it and do it with some scientific rigor, that's a hard problem too. That's the scientific challenge. Now, the way we're going to solve that is we're not just going to have that one pale blue dot. We're going to split that blue color up into a full spectrum of colors from that world. And we're going to look for the telltale fingerprints of certain gases like oxygen and methane. I rely on oxygen and methane a lot as biosignatures. Uh, the reason is it's like college students and pizza, okay? If, if there's a lot of college students in a room and there's pizza in the room, you know someone just delivered the pizza because the college students eat it pretty quickly. From that, you can ascertain that there's a pizza delivery restaurant nearby because, let's be honest, students don't make their own pizza. So by the presence of college students and pizza together, you can figure out that there's a pizza restaurant nearby. Similarly, if there's oxygen and methane and a planet together, you know that there's life there, or at least we think that there's life there. And the reason is because oxygen and methane also destroy each other rapidly. And so you have to replenish them rapidly, and the best replenishment mechanism is life. There's ways to make oxygen without life, there's ways to make methane without life, but to have them in the atmosphere together is almost impossible unless you've got biology making those gases at the surface. And it would have an imprint on the planet's spectrum of colors. This is actually Earth's spectrum here, and you can see the presence of oxygen and methane and other gases in that spectrum of colors. Now, I worry about this a little bit because 20 years ago, when I was chatting with my brother and when astronomers were announcing the discovery of the first planet around a sun-like star, we were also announcing from a different part of the agency evidence for life beyond Earth. We found, we claimed, uh, evidence in these fossilized microbes from a rock that used to sit at the Martian surface. Now, immediately thereafter, and certainly in the 20 years since then, there's been a lot of pushback from the scientific community. And I think the consensus now would be that the evidence in this slide, in this picture, and in this rock for life is just as well described by non-biological processes. So that tells us that although life could have been present in that rock, there is no solid evidence for life in that rock. And I worry about that. I don't want to call up the president and say, Madam President, I found evidence of life. <laughs> and then... <laughs> and have her call a press conference, and then six months later have egg on the face of myself and the other people on that team. I want to know for sure, at least as sure as I can know. And to do that well, it's going to require something broader than just me and my team. It's going to require us talking to people from other disciplines, biologists, chemists, planetary scientists, people that study our own climate on this planet and how the biosphere interacts with our atmosphere here. We need to talk with the space physicists that understand how stars drive planetary climate and biology at the surface of the planet. We need, we, this, is, this is an all-hands-on-deck problem. 
Now, we haven't solved that yet, but we have something in the works called Nexus you'll be hearing about for the next few years. The whole point to Nexus is to break down the stovepipes that we've set up in the past to fund detailed questions, to bring people that study those detailed questions together with those different perspectives. Now, if we do that, and we do the, the technical thing, I think we'll be there, but there's one other challenge that we need to overcome that I think will help us overcome these other two challenges. And that is, when I walk into a room that works on one of these missions, when I go to a conference, to be frank, I see a lot of people that look like me. And that, that, that is a separate challenge in itself. I know a lot of geniuses that don't look anything like me, and so the fact that most of the people I work with look like me tells me we're missing a lot of geniuses in that room. It also is important because research has shown that diverse teams do better. They, they get to better answers more quickly and more efficiently than teams without diversity. So in addition to missing some geniuses, our team just isn't as strong as it could be when a bunch of people have the same backgrounds as me, some of the same privileges that I have, and so are predisposed to thinking like me and making the same mistakes that I'm gonna make. So we need academic diversity. We need people from different academic backgrounds on this team and on these these endeavors, but we also need better cultural and just overall life diversity on these missions. Okay, so if we can overcome that challenge, we're gonna be able to better build a better telescope. If we can build a better telescope, we're also gonna get the data we need and we're gonna be able to analyze it to look for signs of life. And that's gonna put us in a place where 20 years from now, I hope to be looking up with my brother and our, our, our kids at the night sky, and when he asks me if we're alone, I don't wanna just pontificate about what could be out there. I want to look at him and say, yeah, that star right there, that is another sun that has a planet in orbit around it, that has the right conditions for life, and we've observed signs of life on that world. I want to be looking at that night sky in 20 years, and I hope you're all looking at it with me. Thank you.